Hello again. Today I would like to go over something that um, I was asked about in a Twitch chat. I think it was a Twitch chat. Well, it was some chat. Uh, somebody asked me about FOBS. So I should do a presentation on FOBS. Uh, and we'll figure out what that is in a bit. Um, it has to do with nuclear weapons. Uh, so that was a while back, a couple, maybe a month ago. Uh, so I finally decided to just do a presentation on this particular system. But uh, before we can get to that system, we kind of want to go over some other things that preceded it and still exist today. Okay? Uh, so let's take a look at what an ICBM is, basically, but more importantly, how they work. Uh, so to do that, let's go back up here. All right. So what is an ICBM? ICBM. It's an intercontinental ballistic missile. It's a missile, obviously. It can, uh, from the name, it can go between from one continent to another. But the important part of the name here is the ballistic part. All right. We get ballistic from uh, the Greek uh, balin, I think, um, and that means to throw. The pronunciation. I'm not Greek, so. There we go. Uh, it means to throw. All right, and then, for example, if you've ever played, uh, oh gosh, what was it, Age of Empires 1 or maybe 2, they had a unit in there called a ballista, and it would throw giant arrows, essentially. Um, so it's like a giant crossbow of wheels, and it would throw bolts, and the bolts were like giant arrows. Uh, so it was throwing those. It was called a ballista. Um, and uh, so, yeah. A ballistic missile uh, works on a ballistic trajectory, which is the same type of trajectory as when you were, when you throw a ball or when a ballista, for example, would uh, shoot one of those bolts. Uh, it follows this particular curve right here. Uh, not this exact curve, this is just an example. This looks to be about a 45 degree uh, initial angle here, and it will follow a nice, a nice pretty curve. So you start out at 45 degrees here, you go up then hit your peak uh, altitude or elevation, and you come back down at about a 45 degree angle in this particular example. Okay, so this is if we were to throw something, right? Uh, if we were to look at it uh, on Earth here, uh, what we might have is, for example, the U.S. over here and uh, Russia, or not Russia, excuse me, I want to uh, uh, confuse Russia with the Soviet Union. They were not the same. That's a little bit of history. Anyway, uh, the Soviet Union, let's see if we have the U.S. over here and the Soviet Union over there. Uh, what we might see is this missile being launched, this ICBM being launched out of the U.S. or even, you know, by a submarine perhaps, but it would probably be a little over here if it's from a submarine, uh, coming up and falling back down. So it comes up to a peak and it goes this and it goes back down. All right. Now, the peak of these can be as high as 1,200 miles, a little take, give or take a bit, okay? <clears throat> and that, that the peak is up here at the top, okay? Now, during this flight, or this trajectory that the missile is on, you have generally three uh, phases. You have the boost phase, uh, which is where the missile is being propelled by some sort of engine, typically a solid rocket uh, booster, maybe liquid fuel booster engine, I should say. Uh, and it's going up and it's gaining whatever uh, velocity it needs to to get up here into uh, what we call the mid-course, all right? Basically a peak. Uh, this might last, this phase here could last, you know, one minute, uh, five minutes. It really depends on a, a bunch of different factors. Uh, so we won't get too much into that. Just to be aware that there is a part of this phase or this flight, this trajectory, where it is being boosted, all right? Where it's consuming fuel and oxidizer and gaining altitude and velocity, of course. Uh, up here at the mid-course phase, this is, I can't speak, I'm not at liberty to speak too much about this phase up here, um, but there's all sorts of things that go on up here uh, to do various things. Uh, but one of them is that you'll get uh, multiple warheads separating, and then they'll be going and getting ready to go into their targets, all right? And so this happens kind of at the peak, okay? And then this phase down here where we are f coming down is called the terminal phase, and this is purely gravitational, all right? We've boosted up, we've consumed fuel, we've, we've expended energy to get these warheads up here to the peak, and then now we're going to use gravity to get us the rest of the way to our target on this terminal phase. You can see here 
I've drawn one of these little warheads coming down wherever it wants to go. Okay? Now, this is very good because it is relatively, keyword relatively, relatively energy efficient and relatively accurate uh, because the only energy we're expending is to get this thing up here somewhere. All right, the rest of that energy is, is part of it's going to be provided by gravity and the rest of it is just coasting through space essentially. <coughs> At 1200 miles in altitude, the atmosphere is pretty thin as well. Okay, so we don't have a, a lot of that drag to worry about. If we were up here, uh, as opposed to if we were lower uh, in elevation or altitude, more towards the uh, Earth. Okay? So, there's problems with this system, though, and, uh, and, and so let's go over those real quick over here. All right? One way that you can, um, in a nuclear war, in a, in a situation such as this, uh, time is... Um, a lot of nuclear war, let's just say. Time is a, a very important thing uh, for many reasons, but one of the biggest is that you want to be able to mount a response to an attack uh, as quickly as possible before uh, missiles hit your own command and control structure uh, and um, uh, miss, uh, your own ICBMs, your own weapon systems and, and bases and things like that. Uh, a little side note, the Soviet Union went heavy into the deployment and spreading out of weapons, while the U.S. went heavy into the deployment and spreading out of command and control. That's another, another subject, just a little side note there. Uh, but now, how, how can we detect these things? Well, we can, we can detect them with normal radar, but the problem with that is we, if we did it with normal radar, we would only get uh, a little bit of, of um, well, geez, this is... This, this is 1,200 miles, right? We would only get a little area to detect, and it wouldn't give us really any time at all to respond, okay, and to prepare and do things like that, okay? But another thing we can do is we can take a big radar, and we can basically aim it, uh, as you see I've done here, these orange, this is the radar here, and these orange uh, dotted lines are basically the radar cone the coverage area, the beam, if you want to call it that, <clears throat> okay? So you build this huge radar system and you have it aimed out. Not only are you looking out over the horizon, you're looking up into space, all right, up into the sky. And these radars here in the U.S., the ones that we have, uh, the, they're called the SS, SSPARs, uh, Solid State Phased Array Radar System. Those are the new ones, well, newer ones. Uh, we had PAVE PAWS. Uh, PAVE is a, just a generic, or was just a generic term for Air Force electronic, or that the Air Force had for various electronic systems and programs it had. There's a lot of backronyms for that, uh, for the PAVE portion of this. Uh, but it's PAVE PAWS. The PAWS part is a phased array warning system. I don't need to go into what all that technicality means. Another was uh, BMUS, is a ballistic missile array warning system. Okay. So what these things would do is they would just scan the sky. Uh, they don't move physically, they move electronically, um, which again is another subject. And they, they scan the sky and up into space to catch this thing coming down. And we're really going up is what we would like to do. And uh, we want to catch it here if we can. This is the best place to catch one of these things coming up. Uh, the next best place is here to detect it. Uh, and the worst place is when it's coming back down. You're just kind of in, eh, you know. So if, if you can see up here, uh, this goes off the board. But this radar is not just limited to a little space here that can detect around it. It goes all the way, you know, over to here. Well, maybe you, it would probably intersect this. Here's the missile launching, this green line. Like I say, this is the uh, Soviet Union here, and this is the U.S. here. Uh, it would probably intersect this line going up, oh, maybe right about here on the, on the vertical line and, and a little bit above the board, maybe about five inches above the board there. Okay, so you've got all this area, all this area here to detect this, this missile coming in. And if we were to translate that to this, it would probably be from the terminal here, so we've got maybe, maybe about here, okay, to detect. Um, now, the actual detection of, of the system is, is different, what it can detect and when, um, and we're not going to go into that, 
But this is, again, this is just the general idea, the concept, all right? Uh, so we've got that. That kind of helps us uh, not defend against ICBMs necessarily, but prepare, it gives the, the military time to prepare a response, okay? And of course, uh, this isn't directly related uh, to the subject itself, but it is uh, related uh, as a kind of side note for these systems up here, okay? Um, the U.S. has uh, several of them. Uh, the main ones here are Cape Cod Air Force Station, uh, Clear Air Force Station, uh, Beale Air Force Base, and Thule, Greenland. All right, Thule's over there, but that's beside the point. Actually, no, this isn't Thule. Is this is, uh... oops, this is not Thule. This is a different one. This is one in Canada. I can't remember the name of it. It doesn't matter because it's there. Uh, another one that's, that used to be uh, in service but is now mothballed, awaiting reactivation if, if need be, is El Dorado Air Force Station. Now, the funny thing is if you're in the Air Force and you find yourself getting assigned to a place with Air Force Station, you, it might suck. Because, <laughs> uh, for example, uh, some of these places, it's just a building, and that's it for miles and miles. There's one up here in uh, Dakota, I think, or Dakota, I believe, if I remember correctly. The, the, the Air Force Station is basically a big building that looks kind of like this, and uh, a parking lot, a little power building, some houses, and you know, it's out in the middle of the fields. Anyway, that's, that's uh, beside the point. So what these do, these are, if you've, if you've drawn this beam here, right, this radar beam, uh, and that's, that's from the side, these are from the top, they're kind of, this is kind of the shape and the coverage of them, obviously there's not a gap here, uh, but you've got two that are aimed out north, you've got one that's aimed out east, uh, and one that's aimed out west. So how does this tie in with a fractional orbital bombardment system, which is what really the purpose of the video is? Um, well, as you can see, surprise is very important in war. And as you can see here, uh, this, this system does not leave much surprise to somebody who's launching ICBMs at an enemy or an adversary. Okay? So, how can we defeat this or mitigate this? Well, instead of launching an ICBM so high like here, instead of putting it way at 1,200 miles up to give you a really good way to detect it, uh, what you could do is you could reduce this down, okay? You could bring this, this ballistic trajectory down. Now, there's a point where you bring it down and, and, it, and it doesn't really, it's not, doesn't work like you need it to, okay? Um, and what I'm, I should have said this earlier, one of the reasons that we use this type of trajectory is because it's efficient, it's good, it's simple, and so it's at relatively accurate, at well, least it's pretty accurate, and so on and so forth. Uh, but one of the big ones is efficiency, okay? Um, but the further you bring this down, the less efficient it is, the more, basically, more fuel you're going to have to burn to get these warheads to their destination, all right? But, the Soviets decided that they were going to go ahead and, and try and uh, pursue uh, getting this, this down, this altitude down, this maximum altitude, to the point where they basically turned it, instead of a ballistic trajectory like you have here, they turned it into, uh, where is it, out right here, they turned it into an orbit, is what they were going to do, all right? So that means they would launch basically like a regular rocket that would put a satellite into space, something like that. And they would go around the Earth at, a, at an altitude about, about 150 miles peak. And the reason peak is in quotations here is it, it's, it's an orbit. It's not really a peak like it is up here. It's an orbit. But the reason I put peak is because we have peak here. Okay. So you could say that this is a 150 mile, uh, uh, an orbit with a 150 mile altitude. Okay. So they would launch it up and it would come around the Earth like an orbiting satellite. Do, 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 and it would hit the target. Okay? You can also go the other way, like I have drawn up here. Uh, you could go the other way around the top. Okay, you go right over and you hit your target. And as you can see here, this radar, it, it has only this, this much time, as soon as you translate this into time instead of distance, which is easy enough to do if you have the velocity and everything, and the distance. Now, if you were to translate that into time, there's not much time here. Okay? There's really some estimates where uh, you have maybe a minute at most between when you detected this thing coming in and when it hit its target, okay? 
so basically here is if we were to, to compare with this uh, trajectory, if we were to do this on a flat line, you'd see that it would come up. It, again, we're being very basic here, generalizing. It would come up to 150 miles and then go horizontally, essentially, uh, and then descend. It would deorbit itself, if you want to call it that, and hit its target. Okay. Uh, so it's a fractional orbital of a barbit system. Uh, it's orbital because it's going into, well, it's not going to the orbital part, uh, bombardment. It, it, this fractional orbital of a bombardment system is kind of funny because it sounds like it's, you know, Ross from God or some high-tech thing, but it's not, it's not high-tech at all, okay? Uh, so the name itself. This thing could, if you, and, and you probably would have, um, if you're going to use this in all seriousness. These were built and tested and fielded, but they were never used, thankfully. Um, you could make this a complete orbit, and this is, it, it would probably be a smarter thing to do that, to have this thing orbiting um, at least once, the, with the capability to orbit at least once, okay? But to fall in line with various uh, nuclear treaties, uh, they said, oh, well, we're only going to let it go a fraction of an orbit, okay? So that's where you get fractional, all right? Because, like you see here, it's not going to complete orbit, so is it really in violation of a treaty, okay? Uh, so that's why you, where you get that fractional orbital part from, okay? Now, like I said, these things were built, they were tested by the Soviet Union, uh, by, uh, they were built, tested, and fielded by the Soviet Union, they were never used, all right? These, uh, while, while they are good for surprise, very good for surprise, uh, and can be in some cases faster, uh, uh, they have a uh, less, a shorter uh, time to hit the target than a ballistic missile, again, all these you take into uh, account a bunch of variables. They do have uh, some, some serious problems. One of those is fuel efficiency. Very inefficient compared to a ballistic missile. And uh, inter we, could, we could translate that uh, fuel efficiency issue. Here's, here's a list of, of uh, some of the issues with these, some of the big issues. Uh, the fuel efficiency, you could say, the energy expenditure to get this thing into a fractional orbit is high, okay? That means that you're going to have to have more fuel. More fuel means that your warhead is going to have to be smaller and therefore your warhead yield will be less, okay? And then when I mean smaller, I mean in mass. It's going to have to be less massive, okay? Um, accuracy is also a thing. Um, I mean, with a, a ballistic trajectory, even insects can do this. Even an insect can calculate out a ballistic trajectory and it's, you know, five brain cells and usually or often hit the target that it wants to hit. Uh, this is a little more difficult, okay? Because you're going to have to come up here, and this part is kind of relatively easy, getting it up. Uh, but your deorbit operation here and getting it to hit your target, getting this warhead to hit your target, Accurately, it's a little more difficult, okay? Uh, uh, these things could, could have, they could be miles off target, all right? Uh, whereas these, uh, even back in the day, weren't miles off. They were fairly accurate, okay? <clears throat> uh, so let's see, that's the accuracy uh, part here, the re-entry velocity. This is another issue here. These are coming in much into the atmosphere. They're reentering much quicker than these, okay? And what that's going to translate into is uh, you're going to need extra uh, shielding and protection on that warhead as it's coming in, okay? Uh, to basically to ablate away that heat. There's more heat, so you're going to have to have more uh, to protect the warhead itself from all that heat during the reentry. What does that translate into? It again goes back to warhead yield and energy expenditure or the amount of fuel you'll need. Um, so that's another problem, all right? And ultimately, the uh, last one I've listed here is obsolescence. Ultimately, the, all this stuff was rendered basically obsolete uh, because the U.S. eventually got um, satellites into space that, you know, you could, uh, the defense support program, uh, Satellite-based infrared uh, I think it's reconnaissance system, I believe, if I remember. It's been 10 years. Um, basically, what these satellites do is they sit and they have a camera, a camera system that 
sits and basically stares at the disk of the Earth, or an area of the Earth, and it looks for flashes. Again, being very general here, and uh, I'm not at liberty to discuss all of it. But it looks for the flashes of missiles being launched, okay? Uh, and then all that data gets relayed to NORAD, various, you know, units. Um, so that kind of was nullified this stuff because you can, from the flashes, you know, and uh, which basically is the engine firing, right? And the uh, infrared trail and tracks and all that, you could tell, you know, where the missile's going, or probably going to go, uh, where it's probably going to hit, the time of, you know, flight and all this other stuff, okay? Uh, an interesting note on that is uh, back in the first Gulf War, um, a demonstration at Buckley, which is the aerospace data facility up in Colorado, Aurora, Colorado. Uh, and back then it was the Air National Guard Base. Today it is, I believe it's, I think they already named it to the Space Force Base, I believe, I don't know. Uh, but uh, back during the Cold War, what they were doing with these satellites is they were looking at the Middle East, Middle East, and they were watching to see when Iraq would, they were watching for these flashes. And when they see one, they, would, they were able to warn the Patriot missile batteries in uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Israel, you know, all these other places. Well, Kuwait? I don't think they had them in Kuwait. I don't remember. But Saudi Arabia and Israel, um, they were able to send a warning before the, the Patriot batteries themselves were able to pick it up on radar. Okay? Uh, so that's one reason that you had a little bit of success uh, with those Patriot missiles uh, taking those uh, scuds out like they did. Uh, anyway, that's, you know, uh, we only learned years later that that's what was going on. Uh, so that, anyway, that's a little aside. But, uh, so these things were finally, because of the obsolescence mainly and, you know, all this other crap, uh, they were finally taken off, I think they were taken off line in the 80s at the latest. Um, so, uh, and they're not really, as far as we know, they don't exist these days. Because they just, what's the point? It's, it's like the U-2 or SR-71, well not the U-2, the SR-71. It's not really feasible or not feasible, it's not practical, cost effective, so on and so forth. Uh, so hopefully that gives everyone a idea, because this isn't something that's often heard of, about fractional orbital bombardment system, as opposed to intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, so hopefully that kind of uh, gives everybody an idea of what they are, or what they were, and why they existed, and, and why they don't exist now. I forgot one thing, one, one important thing here. Um, relating to the energy expenditure and the ballistic trajectory here, if we were to do some calculations, the ballistic missile will generally, not always, but generally, this boost phase, by the end of this boost phase, will be going about 7 kilometers a second, the velocity of this missile. Okay. So if we're going to take 7 kilometers a second, per second, and translate that into various angles of, uh, of our launch, okay, what we would get for, we want to see how far we would go. What is our range given a uh, launch velocity and a launch angle, all right? This is very simple. We don't actually calculate things out like this um, when, we're, when we're working with this type of stuff. But it gives you an idea of the, the uh, energy inefficiency of, uh, of FOBs compared to ICBM, all right? So, if we were to launch, these are all, all of these are at seven kilometers a second, okay? If we were to launch um, a, a missile, an ICBM, uh, and have it take an 11 degree, um, path during boost phase at 7 kilometers a second, we could expect the warhead to fall about 1,872 kilometers from the launch point, okay? And if we were to launch this missile at a 22 degree angle, okay, we could expect the warhead to fall somewhere around 3,530 kilometers away from the launch point. And at a 45 degree angle, 45 degree angle is again generally going to be the best angle. You're going to get the best uh, bang for your buck in a ballistic trajectory at a 45 degree angle. Okay. That, now that doesn't mean that the 45 degree angle is always the best thing to use. It means from an energy perspective, 
and uh, with a simple mechanics perspective, you're going to get the biggest bang, the most distance, uh, at 45 degrees. So at 45 degrees with a 7 kilometer second uh, velocity, uh, we're going to go about 4,996 kilometers away from the launch point. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to see here, uh, I think I did 22 degrees, I believe is what I, this one is for, and I could be wrong. Um, if we wanted to launch at 11 degrees and end up at about 3,530 kilometers away, the velocity that we'll have to have in that boost phase will need to be 9.7 uh, kilometers a second. I thought that said meters a second. Like, That's not right. It's supposed to be kilometers. So we need about 9.7 kilometers a second. Okay. That uh, doesn't sound much more than the 7 kilometers a second, but when you're dealing with rockets, uh, that can be significant. Okay. So uh, there we go. Going over that and uh, hope that's uh, good.